1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John 3, verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Now, we were created for that very purpose. From the very beginning, before the very first thing on this planet was created, the plan was worked out every infinite, minuscule detail was planned out. When Yeshua sat there and, and we're going to uh, just, I'm not going to turn there, but or at least not yet, but in John 1 where it says that uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, you go to like verse 14, somewhere in that area, but it says all things were created by Yeshua. Okay, so the Father had the plan. He wanted children. Okay? So Yeshua spoke it into existence. Okay? All except Adam and Eve. Because on those two, he didn't speak it into existence. He actually reached down, got his hands dirty to create Adam. And then shortly thereafter, reached into Adam's body to take that part of Adam, that rib, to make Eve up. Okay? So mankind was so important at that time that God was willing to get his hands dirty to create us. But when you think of all of the scope of creation, every infinite, minuscule detail, I mean, just... Uh, recently, I went to the uh, eye doctor, and he and I were talking about how uh, wonderful the eye itself is. You know, all the minuscule little things, and I don't mean to keep repeating the word minuscule, but every little aspect of the eye, you know, evolution, there's no way, no way it can be true. Because there's way too much intricate workings for it to come by chance. I mean, they've had Petri dishes for a long time working and nothing's crawled out of them yet. Okay. But his purpose was that we would become his children. But he didn't want to create robots. Okay. He created Adam and Eve with what's, what's been termed free moral agency. This is the ability to make independent decisions, to think and reason for themselves. But inherent with choice is also the, the possibility of making bad decisions. For a while, Adam and Eve made no choices. They left both trees alone, remember? In the Garden of Eden, they said, of all the trees that are in the, or all the plants that are in the garden, you may freely eat, except one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They didn't ban them from the tree of life. It was Adam and Eve's choice not to take of the tree of life, but also not to take of the tree of good and evil. Okay? But Satan came, gave Eve one of the first recorded sales pitches, and he deceived her. Lord knows each and every one of us, we are inundated with sales pitches everywhere, okay? But she was deceived. Sin was already present, but Adam and Eve had not sinned yet. What is sin? So let's look at it. When Adam and Eve were created, God gave them instructions to follow, and they were obedient up until Satan's involvement. They didn't question God's words, nor were they were rebellious. But God's words are important. They're for our good. They're a blessing to us if we follow them. Let's go to John 17, verse 17. John 17, and verse 17. Christ was praying in the garden. And he says, and I'm just breaking into the whole thing, he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. 
Okay. Let's go back to uh, Matthew 4, verse 4. Matthew 4, in verse 4. Christ was, in, was uh, being tempted by Satan. Remember, Satan says, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Yeshua answered, and he didn't answer of his own. When, we, when Christ was being tempted in the wilderness, everything that came out of Christ's mouth was repeating Scripture. Repeating Scripture. And Christ answered and says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay? So, God's words are important. They're for our good and they're a blessing to us if we follow them. So what is sin? Quite simply, sin is rebellion. It's a choice. It's rebellion against what God has told us to do and how to live. There is, however, a little more to it. Of all the plants in the garden, and I mentioned this a moment ago, the two trees were special, different from all the rest. Other plants would be eaten, they would provide nutrients for the body, and then the waste would be eliminated, become compost. The effect they had on the body was only temporary, but with those two trees, their effect was permanent. Okay, uh, Genesis two seventeen. Genesis chapter two. Well, it's actually verses sixteen and seventeen. And it says, Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, "Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die." Now, up until this point, a lot of people have speculated, what, what were Adam and Eve's bodies like? Okay, well, if they're not going to die, we would look at it as almost like immortal. Except it wasn't. Yes, they were not going to die. But it was still a physical body. It wasn't a glorious spiritual body. Okay? Had they not sinned, had they remained not sinning, Adam and Eve would still be with us today. It's kind of a, a major concept to consider. And I truly believe that in the resurrection that we're looking for, um, in the resurrection, we're going to have a body just like Adam and Eve had that is not going to die. Is it going to be a glorious body? Not yet. But that's for another study. <laughs> um, so, the effect was permanent with those two trees. Through Adam and Eve's choice, choosing to rebel against God, it changed not only them, because remember, Eve was deceived, but Adam was rebellious. Okay? Technically, they were both rebellious, but, okay, because either one had the chance to say no. But it changed not only them, but also all of their descendants thereafter. We cannot undo their choice, but all is not lost. God could have cleaned the slate and started over. There was a couple times, you know, during the flood, he started over with eight people. With Moses, he said, well, I'm just so sick and tired of this, I'm ready to just blast them all away and start over with you. So God has reached that point of frustration a couple of times, but he hasn't done it yet. But instead, he has provided a means for us to be redeemed. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Now, it talks about a, a song that the... Uh, the 24 elders saying it says you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth okay 
So it's Christ's blood that redeems us. But how does it happen? We're going to get to that. It all started with a lamb. When Adam and Eve sinned, and we're, I'm going to turn back to uh, I'm going to turn back to Genesis, but now we're going to be in chapter twenty or chapter three. When Adam and Eve sinned, suddenly everything changed. They felt vulnerable. They felt naked. Remember, they even mentioned that. Well, we're fake, naked. How do you know you're naked? You know, they felt it. Okay? They tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, but those leaves didn't help them. In Genesis 3, 21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, Yahweh the Elohim made tunics of skin and clothed them. No, this isn't very specific. But going with everything else that we read in Scripture, I am convinced that these skins, that a sheep had to die, or numerous sheep, had to die. Okay? Yeshua covered them with skins. He was the one that had to, to slaughter that lamb. He was the one that had to make the clothes for them. Okay? Following, and again, there's a consistent pattern throughout Scripture of this. And most scholars agree that it was a lamb or lambs that was killed to provide the skins for the tunics. There's quite a few sources that believe that. I'm, one. I'm not a source, but I'm a list. Even before the Israelites sacrificed to lamb, lambs to Yahweh. Okay? So this happened, this sacrifice happened way before the Torah was even written or even thought of directly. Okay. It was even before Moses. It was even before Abraham and Isaac. It was even before Job. Before Noah. Before even Abel. Remember Abel offered a sacrifice of the, the sheep. And his was acceptable where Cain's wasn't. Okay. All the way back to Adam and Eve, the pattern was laid down that the innocent had to die for the guilty. That a lamb had to be sacrificed to cover our nakedness. That the blood of that lamb was the only thing that could atone for and wash away our sins. Now, let's, uh, let's go to, ties directly in with this. Let's go to... Uh, Revelation 13, verse 8. Uh, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. From the moment that Adam and Eve took that fruit, Christ had to die. But if you really think about it, he was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He wasn't the lamb slain because of the first sin. Even if Adam and Eve would not have done that sin with one of their children, grandchildren, somewhere, somebody would have decided to sin. At that point, Christ still had to die. Um, now let's turn to John chapter 1, and I'm going to... Uh, I referenced this a minute ago, and we're going to... We're going to quickly read it. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So this individual called the Word, the spokesman, the one who spoke it or sung, there are many places believe because the word spoke in here actually has the connotation of singing it. And we know that there's more power in, this, in this, the singing voice than there is in the spoken word. That's not for this study. But it says, without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. 
this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now as we're reading this, we can actually point our finger at ourselves as well. Okay, If we receive Christ, he gives us the right to become children of God, if we believe in his name. Okay, It says, who were born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, and it's interesting because it says, for, John says, For he was before me. It was interesting that John was six months older than Christ. <laughs> so, anyway, but yet, John recognized that this was Christ, the Word. All the way from the beginning of time okay and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses but grace and truth came through Yeshua the Messiah no one has seen God at any time the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him let's just kind of real quickly I'm going to make a, a real quick synopsis of what we just got done reading uh, verses 1 through 3 the word was with God L -O -A, and the word was God L they're not the same person okay the word was the one who created everything he is the creator verses 4 through 13 at the time of Yeshua John the Baptist bore witness about Yeshua Yeshua came, but the world didn't recognize him as the Messiah. Those who recognized Yeshua as the Savior and embraced him as such, those who believe in his name are given the right to become Eloah, the Father's children. Flesh and blood, willpower, nor desire. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It doesn't matter. It's not enough. None of these will make us a part of that family. Only those who accept Yeshua's sacrifice will be a part of that family. Let's go to four, verses 14 through 18. Our El, our God, became flesh and blood and lived among us. Yeshua's glory was manifested to mankind. He was the only begotten of the Father. He is the only one that the Father has had direct contact or involvement with him being here. He was full of grace. Now what is grace? It's a matter of second chances. Okay? He was full of grace and truth. The law was given through Moses and grace and truth were added to it. Okay? He didn't replace it. It was added to it. Remember where, uh, it's not one of the verses in my thing, remember where in uh, Matthew 23, that he was talking about uh, to the Pharisees, he says, you tithe of mint and anise, and, you know, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. You should have done what the first without neglecting the, the other. Yes, still keep the law, but add to it the way to your matters for the law. So we saw Yeshua, but he is not the Father. No man has seen the Father at any time, except Yeshua who came from the Father. Now, let's go over now to John chapter 12. John 12, verses 44 through 50. John 12, 44 through 50. Yeshua cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. 
And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I don't judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word which I, that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Okay? Christ did not come into the world to judge it. That will happen later. He came into the world because it says that all, you know, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is Lord. We know that we will all stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ. Okay. So that judgment is coming. But that was not the purpose he came back then. Okay. But he came into the world to offer salvation to whomever will accept it. Now, Many more verses show that only through Yeshua's sacrifice can sin be forgiven. <coughs> but how about your life? We started out this study speaking about sin and decisions. <coughs> decisions that lead to us sinning and decisions after. Have you led a sin-free life? Of course not. We've all hurt others. We've all led our self-centeredness influence our decisions. We've all had biases that caused us to feel superior to others. We've all been rebellious. We've all made decisions we've regretted. Sin affects relationships, whether it's a relationship against God, against people we don't know, against our family or friends, or even against ourselves. As we've gone about our lives, our list of sins builds up. Scripture, in Revelation 20 especially, and we're not going to return to it, but I'm just referring to it. Scripture in Revelation 20 especially speaks of a coming time of judgment where we will all stand before God and give an account of our lives, and we will be judged accordingly. Any sins that we have that are still active in our life, or sins that we haven't been forgiven for are the sins that we will be judged for. So how long is your list? Forgiveness for sins? What a concept. If only it were true. How many times you've heard, oh, if, how many times you thought, if only I could have the opportunity to do it all over again, I would do... Yeah. Really? Really? Would you do it different? I've been asked that question before. You know, if I had it to do all over again, what would I do differently? After thinking about it, I thought, you know, probably nothing. Because the, the situations I've been in, the, the sins I've had, everything has made me the person that I am today. And I'm not happy with who I am today. I'll never be happy in this flesh and blood shell. But I'm a lot more at peace with myself now than I was 20 years ago, 40 years ago. I, I remember back of the person that I used to be, and I was not a nice person. I don't like the old me. I'm glad I'm a new creation, a new, a new purpose, person. Perfect? No. But working toward it. Okay? And I've heard a lot of people. A lot of people. You know, we have that opportunity. We have that opportunity to do it all over again. But you have to really want it. And you have to be very serious. That forgiveness for sins is a part of baptism. So let's take a few minutes and look at what is involved in a baptism as well as some of the deeper concepts. So we're going to start with Acts chapter 2. 
starting in verse 1, we read about the Holy Spirit, you know, coming on the day of Pentecost. Now, there were 120 people there, but it, and it manifested as tongues of fire. When you get down to verses 5 through 13, I'm just kind of giving a synopsis. When you get to from uh, verses 5 through 13, we see the disciples speaking in the languages of foreign countries, glorifying God for what he's done. Now, some people were amazed and perplexed, and some mocked. When we get to verses 14 through 36, Peter stands up and starts preaching to them about Yeshua, ultimately impressing upon them that each and every one of them shared the responsibility and the guilt for Yeshua's crucifixion. Why? Because even if they didn't personally, physically have a hand in accusing, convicting, or killing him, their sins were the reason he had to die. Verse 37, and this I am going to read. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, what's, what's the answer? What's the solution? In verses 38 and 39, Peter answered and he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yeshua the Messiah for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. So he even included the Gentiles, people from faraway nations. Why did he tell, why is it that the Great Commission, we're going to cover that, cover that a little bit later, but why is the Great Commission says, go, preach the gospel, so that everybody can hear about Christ? Besides the conviction that we also are just as guilty for Yeshua's death, three points are made here in, in this section of verses we just read. Number one, repent. Now, repent means to be genuinely sorry for, to reject sin, and to effect change. Repent means it's like if you're walking east, if you're going to repent, you're going to turn around and walk west. You know, it's talking about going another way. Okay? But that genuinely, genuine godly sorrow is a part of repentance. We reach that point where we're so sick and tired of banging our head against the wall, of, of you know, watching ourselves hurt other people, whether it be our mouth, our actions, or whatever. It says, repent and be baptized. This is talking immersion. And we're going to go into this a little bit later in the study as well. In Yeshua's name, not the Trinity, not into a denomination, not into a local church. The idea that if, if I'm going to go to a church down the street, the only way I can fellowship with them is I've got to get baptized by them? No, it's not going to happen. Why is that? Why is that? When you get baptized, you become a part of a huge family around the world. Why would I have to get rebaptized? To go into somebody's building. I mean, is that an exclusive club of some sort where, you know, I just can't fellowship with those people. I've got to use the other restroom, you know? <laughs> no, it's not that way. So, we, we do it in Yeshua's name. Now, a lot of people, um, especially Trinitarians, they have an issue because they say, yeah, but look, you know, Scripture shows the Trinity. Okay. Again, this isn't part of the study, but I'll just real quickly touch it. Okay, where does it say? Well, let's see, 1 John 5, 7. Okay, there is not one single scholar that takes that set of verses seriously because it was changed. Even now I have a commentary in my Bible, and even in my commentary, it's, it's ironic because and this is 
John Carther, I guess. Anyway, uh, he said he talks about how the Trinity wasn't even uh, an issue until about a thousand A.D. Okay, and and he even talks about all the way up to just a hundred or two hundred years ago that it was never put into the Bible. And yet, at the very end of it, where he lays all this out, he says, "But I still believe in the Trinity." <laughs> okay. So, but First John five seven and Matthew twenty eight are the only two places where the Trinitarian formula is used. Okay, because in Matthew twenty eight it says, "Go unto all the nations, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." I was baptized in the Trinitarian formula, but then I come to find out later that it's not scriptural, because there is not one other single verse that says you need to be baptized. Everything says that when you're baptized, you're baptized into the name of Yeshua for the remission of your sins. Period. So if it's not backed up, except for by one other verse that every scholar admits is not, it was added to Scripture. Well, it makes Matthew 28 a little suspect there too. But anyway, you do it in Yeshua's name. Why? For the remission of your sins. What is remission? It means to remit or pay for. We have earned a death penalty for our sins. And Christ says, you know, you've come to me. I will pay your debt. And he applies his blood, which has already been shed, to our debt. Uh, our debt. Otherwise, it would be our, our death. Okay? So, what, he, what Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Yeshua for the remission of your sins. Point number two, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to cover that a little later in the, in the subject as well, our study. And then point number three, God is not a respecter of persons. When it says that uh, to you and your children, to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. Okay? He is not a respecter of person. Many are called if you're chosen. But you have to respond to the call. It doesn't matter if you're an aborigine. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. If you reply to Yeshua's call, he's going to start working with you. You have just as much of a chance as anyone else. So, let's go now to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 15 through 21. Everybody's so familiar with John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Yeah, but they don't read before and after. And I'm going to start in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. To God be the glory, not to us. Okay. Now, I'm going to real quickly go through this. You know where he says, as Moses was lifted up in, like the serpent in the wilderness. Um, that is in the, the book of Numbers where that is, is spoken of. But as um, a plague of snakes was sent into the Israelite camp because of their sins, and many died. The snake on a pole, which was called the Caduceus, and it's the... the uh, symbol of the medical profession, one of the symbols. 
Okay, the, the caduceus represented their sin, and when they repented, and you actually see when you read that in Numbers, that when they repented, the death, the dying stopped. But the whole purpose was for them to see the fact that their sin had caused this situation. Those who were rebellious, however, died. Now, the same is with Yeshua. He was fastened to a pole, and if we truly repent and believe in him, we will not perish, but receive everlasting eternal life. That's why the Father sent him to die for us, so that we could be saved from the death penalty. He didn't send Yeshua to judge the world, but rather to redeem or buy us back from our sins through his shed blood. Now, let's go to Romans 6.23, just real quick and simple. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and Yeshua the Messiah, our Master. Okay? We are under a death penalty. We've earned it. We don't want our sins to be revealed, and many will refuse Yeshua because they are enjoying sin. But if we believe that Yeshua is the Savior and that his blood covers our sins, we are taken out from under that death penalty. It no longer hangs over our head. Okay. Now, I, I want to take a, a, a short little while, and I want to clarify a couple of things before we go on. First, some people believe in a false doctrine of, it's called once saved, always saved. Now, we're going to turn to a couple of verses real quick. Um, we're going to go to Isaiah 1, verses 18 through 20. Isaiah 1, 18 through 20. It says, Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They are red, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the lamb. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Okay? Now, but once you accept Christ, I mean, you're, you're saved. You've got a maid. You don't have to worry. Nothing you do is going to affect your salvation, right? Hmm. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Let's turn to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33, verses 12 through 20. Ezekiel 33, 12 through 20. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, The righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that, that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he's committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And we saw this with Nineveh and, and Jonah. Okay? When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Yet the children of your people say, the way of Yahweh is not fair. But it is their way which is not fair. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say the way of Yahweh is not fair. O house of Israel, I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. 
Okay, so the idea that oh well, you know, I can do whatever I want to. I've, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, and you know, no, that's not true. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that have been taught that and believe it. Let's look at now. A lot of people would say, okay, but both of those are in the Old Testament. There's nothing in the New Testament that says that. Well, let's turn to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, verses 4 and 5. Well, actually, I'm going to go 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. I want to start this over again. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, once our mind is open to the existence of God and have tasted the heavenly gift. Okay? They have been around somebody and experienced or seen something that was the work of the Holy Spirit and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the age to come. If you look at this in an overview, this is spiritual growth and progression. All the way from, oh, you mean there really is a God? You mean evolution's wrong? All the way up to being able to speak and somebody's healed, to cast out demons, to stand against thresholds. Okay? We're talking spiritual empowerment at that point. Okay? If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. You're given one chance. If you reject Christ and reject God, there's no second chance. Because at that point, you'd say, well, okay, but I was wrong, and you know, I want to repent, and I want to get Christ back. I'm sorry. You would be crucifying him twice to have his blood cover you a second time. Crucifies Christ a second time. It's not allowed. I want to share with you a little story that this is a long time ago. I think it was late 90s in that area. I had gone to Promise Keepers with another gentleman and I was so impressed with it that um, I, for three, he paid for my way the first year, and for three years after that, I sponsored other people to take them. Well, my brother Paul was one of the people I sponsored, and we went to a Promise Keepers, and I believe it was in Dallas. Um, anyway, so here we are, we have 40,000 men sitting there praising God, worshiping. Um, we were singing some songs, and I believe, I don't remember whether it was Amazing Grace or How Great They Are, but it was one of the two. And it was so powerful that, you know, all these guys were on their feet, and all of them are belting it out to the greatest of their ability. It actually made the newspapers because they clearly heard it seven miles away, okay? But it had another thing about that particular Promise Keepers, too. We were um, not quite in the nosebleed section, but we were up there a ways, and we were pretty close to the end of a row. I was standing there, my brother Paul was standing next to me, and and there was a Catholic priest walk, and I'm taking this Catholic priest because he was wearing the, the garb with the little white hickey thing in front of him. <laughs> I don't know what they call it, but anyway. Um, and so this individual came up, and he looked kind of confused, but he stood beside Paul, and around the stadium, you saw everybody joining hands, you know, while we were singing. And my brother Paul reached out and, and grabbed that guy's hand, and look, I tell you, he looked terrified. <laughs> he, he literally. 
but when when it was all over with and we were driving home, my brother Paul turned to me and said, you know, he says, I have attended a Baptist church for quite a few years, and I've always been told that I was saved. He says, this experience has showed me that I do not have the Holy Spirit, and I want it. The Holy Spirit can work on the outside and work with you throughout your entire life, but there's a difference between it working on the outside and working on the inside. And it took that particular event to convict him that he needed to be baptized. Okay? He'd done the whole uh, Romans 9, you know, if you confess with your mouth. And he'd done all that. And he was told he was saved. But he realized that he didn't have Christ in him, and he wanted it. Now, again, Hebrews 6, 4, and 5, we just got done reading, it shows a progression of spiritual growth. Verse 6 says that if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now, I want to, I want to clarify this. We're not talking backsliding. Backsliding is, yes, it's dangerous, but Scripture tells us that if we can pull somebody away from that, we're saving a soul. In essence, I'm kind of paraphrasing it. But this speaks of total rejection, rejecting Yahweh and going back to the world. That's what Hebrews uh, 6, 6 is talking about. Totally turning away. That's why scripture uh, calls the back and forth, you know, that going between Yahweh, the world, and demon gods, you know. How many times did Israel do that? And what did Yahweh call it? He called it harlotry. Hmm. Interesting. That he would use the analogy of a streetwalker and saying, well, you're doing it with me by choosing other gods. So ultimately, if you commit to Christ, stay with him. You know, and one more verse that we're going to uh, real quickly turn to is uh, Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2, verse 12. As we were talking about uh, all of this, about how you can't lose your salvation. 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How do you work out your own salvation? Good question. How do you? Ultimately, it comes down to you need to be aware, you need to have your head in the right place and make sure that you're not doing what it takes to lose that salvation and to maintain that throughout your life. You have to keep doing what's right. It doesn't matter what you go through, how hard it gets, it doesn't matter. Now, the next thing we're going to cover is baptism itself. Hebrews 6, 1 through 2. So, we were at Hebrews 6, Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. I mean, verse 3 of it. Anyway, I don't know if, if you guys are aware of this. What are the elementary principles of Christ? It just listed six of them. And it's interesting, it says, not laying again the foundation. So the foundation of our faith needs to be built on these six items. And the doctrine of baptisms is one of them. Okay. Now, would you be surprised if I told you that there's three? There's three baptisms men mentioned in Scripture. Okay, And we're going to cover, cover these. After all, that is what this study is about, baptism. Um, first one is baptism by water. Okay. 
The Greek word baptizo means to wash clean and it means to immerse. Not sprinkle, not pour, not a partial immersion. We're talking fully wet. One of the things it symbolizes is to be all in, in essence, fully committed. Let's go to Isaiah 64, verse 6. It says, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and all of and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. When it says that our righteousness is, is filthy rags, you, you know the uh, original Hebrew word that talks about that filthy rags is talking menstrual rags. I don't care. There's not a single person on this planet who wants anything to do with them. Okay, they're disgusting to all of us and just as disgusting to Yahweh, but it's necessary, I understand that. But our righteousnesses are detestable to God. Okay? We are unclean. Baptism is not a New Testament creation. Okay. The Jews feel, now remember, we're part of the Judeo-Christian ethic. We actually worship in the same Bible, although some Jews still only read the Tanakh, but there are many of them today that, that read the whole scripture. The Jews feel that they cannot approach God while unclean. So they practice a, a ceremony called the mikvah. I did a little bit of study on that. Now that, what that is is a ceremonial bath that symbolizes their being clean before Yahweh. Um, there were even numerous examples uh, in Scripture where God told the Israelites, take a bath, wash, wash your clothes, be clean when I show up. Okay? Uh, one of them was in uh, Exodus 19 that I saw because he told them, you know, I'm going to show up. Make sure your clothes are clean. You know. But that idea of being clean before God, because we are unclean, and it's, it's not that he's going to smell us, it's just the idea we need to understand we're unclean because of our sin. Okay. Um, let's look at Isaiah 1, we, um, we read Isaiah 1 here a little while ago. Let's go to Isaiah 1, verses 16 and 17, the last time we had 18 through 20. 16 through 17 says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. God himself is telling us that we need to clean up our lives. Now, can we do that of our own, uh, of our own strength, our own ability? No. This is where having that Holy Spirit, having that commitment to God to do what he wants us to do, to change, to be the person he wants us to be is so important. Now, um, let's turn to Romans chapter 6. So I'm going to do the hard way. Okay. Romans 6, verses 1 through 14. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as us as were baptized into the issue of the Messiah were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, 
certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. His purpose was to come and die for sin, period. Yes, we can each and every one of us hold our hand up and point the finger at us. He died for me. But again, that's for whoever accepts and embraces Christ. Um, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in, in Yeshua the Messiah, our Master. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What's the difference between law and grace? Well, the law is a set of rules that says you shouldn't do this, you should not do this. What is grace? Well, if you know that the law says, okay, if you do this, it's a sin, and then Romans says, um, you know, the, pen, the wages of sin is death. So if you do this, you got the death penalty hanging over your kid, your head. But once you're walking with Christ, walking with God, grace is the opportunity to have a second chance. It's like having a child, and you're walking along with them, and they stumble. What do you do? You can sit there and yell at the child, tell him to get up and, and get walking, or you can reach down, pick him up, brush off his knees, you know, comfort the tears and, and what have you, and keep walking. That's what God does is with us. That's why grace is so important in our life. He gives us that second chance. Keep walking. Yes, we are going to sin. Yes. The law says you shall not do this, and we find ourselves doing these things. And God gives us the opportunity to repent and repent and repent as many times as it takes. If you truly are wanting to change, not... Let me give you another example. I had a, um, a family that they had seven boys, and... When they found out that I actually knew how to cut hair, you know, not perfectly or anything, but when they found out I would cut, could cut hair, they actually had me come over once a month and give their kids a haircut. Not a big deal. This one was a very precocious little redhead. Yeah, and I'm being nice when I say this. Because he was one of those that, you know, poke you. Poke you. I'm not poking you. Yeah, that, that type of child. Well, he did something to me, but his parents had taught him that when you do something wrong to somebody, you ask for forgiveness. So he did that. You know, he did something, and he said, would you forgive me? I said, sure. About the fifth time he did that, the same thing. Would you forgive me? I said, no. And the kid was shocked, and his parents were shocked. I said, no, I, I refuse to forgive you because you intend to do it again. <laughs> do we ever do that with God? Do we ever do that with God where, you know, finally he's just so fed up with his fine. He needs to turn us over his knee because we refuse to do what's right. Time and time and time again, grace has been applied. Get up and, and quit sinning. Oh, but you intend to do it again. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I, I finished that. Okay. 
we are immersed into Christ's death, and that baptism is symbolic of that death. But Yeshua rose from the grave, so we also are raised from the water to walk in newness of life, to be a different person, to be dead to sin. Our life needs to be devoted to Yeshua and the Father. Our old man died, and he needs to stay dead. How about baptizing babies? Well, it's Catholic and not scriptural. Not scriptural. Babies need to be mature enough to choose to follow Christ. Generally, children are also included in this, also because of maturity and choice, but also because of hormones. Now, I have witnessed exceptions, but puberty can be really rough on a lot of people. Okay. I, um, here about a year and a half ago, I was asked to, you know, they had two kids, one was about eight years old and the other was 10 or 11 years old, and I was asked if I would do their baptism. And I sat down with the kids and I had a really long talk, and not only did I ask them a lot of questions, but I actually um, got very good answers. I got the answers from them that I was looking for from an adult, and yet these children knew what they wanted. They wanted that relationship with Christ. Where would that be any different than Philip and the eunuch, when the eunuch says, well, what stops me from being baptized? <laughs> if your attitude's there, it's there. I did go through with the, the baptism, and I'm very pleased to say that even in their schools, those kids defend Yahweh constantly. Okay, these kids are, you know, they read the Bible faithfully. They, I mean, they carry on adult conversations with adults. So, you know, do I feel bad about having done uh, baptism for kids? No. I explained to them that, you know, puberty could be rough. And the girl was the older one, and she was, you know, 11, but she was starting into puberty, they're still just as active or more so even than when they first got baptized. That's very encouraging. But for the most part, I don't want to baptize children because I've seen way too many times when that puberty kicks in and those hormones and all of a sudden you're wanting to be popular, you're wanting to do you know, all these other things and it can lead to sin real quick. One other aspect about baptism is getting baptized for the wrong reason. For instance, just because your husband, wife, sister, etc. is getting baptized doesn't mean that you are ready for it. Having a mountaintop high doesn't make you ready for baptism. Because there are so many churches out there that I had a friend of mine I confronted him on this because he was talking about how spirit-filled and spirit-led his church was. And he, talks, he was talking to me one day about how every Sunday he went and gave his heart to the Lord. I looked at him and I said, what, it didn't happen the first time? Why is it that you have to go back every Sunday to get that mountaintop high again? It's because it's not lasting. And by the end of the week, you feel drained. And, and So that mountaintop high doesn't make you ready. It's actually a sales pitch is what it is. And be aware of coercion. Because if someone or some denomination is looking for a quota of people that they got saved, their quota is not true spiritual conversion. I know. So you've got to be careful. Make sure that you're, if you decide to get baptized, that you're doing it for the right reason. Okay. Let's go to the second one. We talked about baptism by water. Let's look at the second one. Baptism of the Spirit. Okay. As, as we have read in Acts 2 earlier, the first step is true repentance, then baptize, baptism. Because remember, he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Yeshua for the remission of sins. You need to be thoroughly convinced that you need a Savior before you're baptized. 
However, just because you're baptized doesn't mean you automatically receive the Holy Spirit. Let's use the example of Philip and, Philip and the eunuch from Acts chapter 8. So let's turn to Acts chapter Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge, this Ethiopian, or this eunuch had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him. Okay. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Yeshua to, excuse me, to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Yeshua the Messiah is the Son of God. Now I realize that I originally said verses 26 through 38. What? That is, okay, I'm sorry. So he commanded the chariot to sit still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Did it say he received the Holy Spirit? No. Doesn't say that at all. As the eunuch was returning to Ethiopia, he, and this section of verses we read is Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. But he was reading this, and he was struggling to understand it. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip to overtake the chariot and to speak to him. Philip started at that set of verses. And when we preach the gospel, people, this is exactly what we are to do. If somebody has questions, Listen to their questions, but you can take where they are at, the question that they are presenting you with, and tie it in with the gospel. The gospel is one gospel. It's got many facets, many aspects, but it's one gospel. And we are to preach the gospel. Okay? And you can take any point and tie it all together. And that's what people are looking for. This, the eunuch was getting just a tiny thing where he says, as he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Being able to tie it in and say, you know, Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And this is kind of some of the things that we've been going on over here. But he explained how Yeshua was that lamb that was slain to, take, slain to take away our sins. When they came to a body of water, the eunuch asked if there was anything that would hinder him from being baptized, accepting Yeshua's sacrifice to remove that death penalty from his life. What was Philip's response? Well, let's see, if you join the part of my church. <laughs> no. If you believe with all your heart, you may. Okay? The eunuch's response, I believe that Yeshua the Messiah is the Son of God. Now what the eunuch responded is interesting because it went against the narrative that the scribes and the Pharisees were pushing. They were saying that Christ was a teacher, and they couldn't deny his good works and the miracles. But they say that he is not the Messiah they were waiting for. And they definitely didn't want to accept him as the Son of God. Yet here, the eunuch saw it and declared it. But again, nowhere does it even hint that the eunuch received the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Now, I mentioned Matthew 28. I'm not going to turn there. In Matthew 28, 
What are the four parts of the Great Commission that we've been given? Go. Get off your butt and move. Two. Make disciples. Preach the gospel. Three. Baptize. Number four. Teach them. Interestingly, receiving the Holy Spirit is not even hinted at in that. We'll get to this a little later, because the question is going to, obviously, why? Why is it not? Now, to be fair, Yeshua had just recently risen when he said that, when he talked about the, you know, the Great Commission. He had risen. He hadn't yet gone up to the Father. But he promised that the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, would be sent to them. And just a few weeks later on Pentecost, they did receive the Holy Spirit. But this brings me to a concept I re that I personally refer to as the Acts chapter 8 anomaly. Now, Daryl and Vicki heard me talking about this yesterday. But the Acts 8 anomaly, what, why would it be an anomaly? Because it goes against a lot of the teachings that we are told. But let's turn to Acts chapter 8. And this time we're going to instead of uh, this, we're going to back up to verse 4. We're going to read uh, verses 4 through 23. Okay. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And it was talking about the apostle uh, Saul, or Saul, uh, persecuting the church. Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Does anybody know the, the significance of the city of Samaria, besides the fact that the Samaritans? Well, it's because when um, the nation of Israel split up after Solomon through Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and the kingdom of Judah was what he took. Jerusalem was the capital. Jeroboam was the one that became the ruler, leader over Israel, the northern ten tribes, and the city of Samaria was their capital. Okay? So even when you see in Scripture where it talks about, oh, these Samaritan women, or I'm sorry, these were still Israelites. They may have gone into apostasy before the Jews did, but the Jews followed suit. So, anyway, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed. They listened. He said, he, you know, he had a, I'm a great person. He had a sign out. Everybody believed him. Okay? All gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Master Yeshua. 
Then, Peter and John, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray that God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. He had a wrong attitude. That was all there was to it. He was wanting power, authority. He was wanting control. That sounds like a politician. Now again, the multitudes of the people heard the preaching and saw the miracles. They believed it and were baptized. An individual by the name of Simon had set himself up as someone great and important. And he used sorceries as miracles to fool the people. But magic is only an illusion, not real power. After hearing the preaching and seeing the miracles, he also believed. He knew it was the work of God. He knew it was the power of God doing it. He couldn't deny it. And he also was baptized. Now again, the apostles in Jerusalem, and I'm, I'm reiterating this because it's, we've got a point we're going to come up across here. The apostles in Jerusalem heard about the work Philip was doing, so Peter and John went to Samaria and prayed that they would receive the Holy Spirit because even though they were baptized, none had received the Spirit. Philip had the Holy Spirit, but not anyone else there in Samaria. However, when Simon saw that by the lake... Now, Philip had the Holy Spirit, but not anyone else. However, when Simon saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hand, the Holy Spirit was given, he knew his deceptions were nothing compared to the power of God. And because he wanted the Holy Spirit, he offered money. His motivation was wrong, so he was denied. The point being that even though Philip had the Holy Spirit, he was not an elder. Peter and John, however, were elders. This is backed up in 1 Timothy 4.14. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 14. It says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Now, the old King James says presbytery, but it's still the ministry. Now, it's interesting. It says it is given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands. Why is that important? Because as an elder is doing this, he is supposed to say a prayer while he is anointing the person. And we're going to cover that as well here shortly. While he is laying the hands on the person. What comes out of his mouth should not be something written down. What should come out of his mouth is what God wants to come out of his mouth. And that's the gift of prophecy. That's what prophecy is. Speaking God's word. Most churches don't teach or practice it. Most churches don't even understand it. Now, I'm going to go into the why. Well, it seems like we have a little bit of technical problems, so we're going to take a real quick break and see if we can clear this up, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm down to teach, or sh showing you the third baptism. The third baptism is called baptism by fire. If we turn to Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, it says, Luke 3, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. To loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, it, you know, he was speaking of Yeshua, and, he, and 
he stated that we would be baptized, immersed with the Holy Spirit. We know that the immersion with water would come first, and then immersion with the Holy Spirit. But it says immersion with fire. Now, when we follow Yeshua, we stand out. We go against the norms. When we embrace the light, those who have embraced the darkness will do what they can to silence us. Most Christians associate fire with Gehenna, and they want to avoid it. However, let's, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 19. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake in, of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. But on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? And he was actually quoting in, uh, I believe it was Proverbs 11.31, but we're not going to talk to that. It says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. So, again, when we follow Yeshua, we are going to stand out. But here in 1 Peter, it tells us to rejoice when you go through it. Give glory to God. Let the fire refine you as fire refines precious metals. If you have gold, for instance, one of the old ways, now they have other ways to do it as well, but the oldest way going back, millennia has always been to heat the gold until it is in its liquid form. When it is a liquid, you have to maintain the heat under it so that the, uh, the impurities, gold is a very heavy metal, so the impurities, the gold settles down and the impurities float to the top. So they skim that, the impurities, it's called the dross, and they skim those impurities off, and the longer you hold it under the heat, the purer it becomes. Now, let the fire, and this is talking about trials and tribulations and the things that we go through after, not, not while we're still in the world, but this is talking about the things we go through after we have joined ourselves to Christ to become a Christian. Allow these things to refine you. The more you do, the more precious you become to God. Now, earlier in the study, we looked at Hebrews 6, um, verses 1 and 2, and I pointed out that the doctrine of, of baptisms was one of the foundational principles of Christ. Of the six items listed in that passage, the laying on of hands is also listed as one. So let's quickly look at the why. As we go through this, keep in mind that Simon the sorcerer was denied, and many, even after Yeshua's resurrection, did not automatically receive it. When is it recorded in the Old Testament that a person of religious authority, a priest, 
laid hands on someone and or pour, poured oil on them. It was done for only two reasons. Number one, it is an anointing into office for either a king or a priest. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6. Exodus 19, 4 through 6. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all of the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Did you catch that? You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, kings and priests, and a holy nation. Okay? Now, Yahweh declared his intention of making Israel a kingdom of priests. We just got done reading. In Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, and we'll quickly turn over there as well. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Yeshua and shall reign with him a thousand years. Isn't it interesting? It's not one of the verses in here in my study. But if you were to back up a chapter to Revelation 19, what does it say? That he comes with a name written on his thigh that says, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is coming as the king. But it sounds like we're going to be given kingship. Is there any other scriptures to back that up? Absolutely. If you were to read, and again, it's not one of the verses in my study, but if you were to read the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, well done, you good and faithful servant. Be you over five cities. Well done, you good and faithful service, servant. Be over ten cities. The same thing is said to both of them. It doesn't matter how much they did. They were both faithful. And they were both rewarded with, well, let's see. Um, if you're going to be over a bunch of cities, whether you're a mayor, but also a king. We will be kings in the kingdom. And Christ will be our king, the king of kings. We need to think about that. We need to take it seriously. So what is the laying on of hands? It is an appointment into a position of leadership or authority, but it has to be done by an elder that has the Holy Spirit. Now, I emphasize this. Because, you know, you just can't walk up to somebody, well, I'm going to anoint you as king in, in Christ's kingdom. I'm sorry, you don't have that authority. And we as elders, it is a very serious thing for us because we are told not to be hasty in laying hands on people. Again, that's not one of the verses I have here, but, but it is in Scripture. Okay, so it's a very serious matter. 
And when we do it, why, what are we actually doing? Are we giving you the Holy Spirit? No. That, that receiving the Holy Spirit is God's prerogative. He is the one that chooses whether you are going to, you know, it's like Simon the Sorcerer. We already covered it. Okay. Why did he get refused? Why is it that they refused to lay hands on him? Well, ultimately it's because his attitude stunk. He had, he had self-interest in mind. He wanted to be the one to give the Holy Spirit, to choose who he can give the Holy Spirit to. That was not his choice to make. That's God's choice to make. We as elders, though, are required as part of our duty, our job, our authority within the church, not over the church, but within the church. Our authority says that we have a certain job we have to do. We have to be teachers, for instance. If you have somebody that doesn't have the gift of teaching, why are they a pastor? Just throwing it out there. Okay? But, the, but it has to be done. Just like with a baptism, an elder has to be present. He has to be involved with the baptism. But the laying on of hands has to be done by an elder. And that elder has to have the Holy Spirit. I've met some that don't. I've met pastors that I seriously doubt that they have the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not going to make that judgment. But I know that if they have the Holy Spirit, they're definitely quenching it, which is kind of a dangerous place to be. But even if you are anointed, you are anointed to be a king or a priest, but you don't become that king or priest in the here and now. But if you grow spiritually, you overcome and don't go back to the world. That anointing qualifies your position in the kingdom. When you are raised and you stand before Christ, because I believe that there will be a judgment at Christ's return. There are verses that talk about this. A lot of people say, oh, the only judgment's going to be at the white throne judgment. Or some people say that there's not going to be a judgment at all, which, you know, is one of the reasons that they're allowed to sin, but still. The bottom line is, I believe that we are going to stand in front of Christ. We have called ourselves a Christian. The New Testament says, let he who names the, the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Quit sinning. God has given us a bunch of rules and regulations. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to. They think it's too restrictive. But you know something? That's a lawless attitude. The idea that you want to live outside of the law the reason, you know, God didn't do this just because he was wanting to be spiteful to humans. No. He made these rules and regulations for us, for our benefit. He wants us to be happy, to live fulfilled lives, to learn, to grow, to, to grow spiritually. And we need certain things in our life for that to happen effectively. Yeah. We live in a dysfunctional world. It's very tough for us to do it. But even Cain lived in a dysfunctional world. Because by that time, when Adam and Eve sinned, death had already entered the world. Tree of knowledge and good and evil had already been partaken of. Mankind's DNA was already changed. And... He also had a difficult time. It, it was so difficult for him that he got extremely jealous of his brother and killed him. We have to face the same things. These are part of the trials we talked about just a little. But now I need to go to one more aspect of this. Okay. One more aspect needs to be presented. In Scripture, as well as in our world, we see so many examples of evil kings and evil priests. 
all you've got to do is read, you know, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. You start reading through this, or Ezra, Nehemiah, you start reading through the Old Testament, and it gives a documentation. I mean, it doesn't glorify anybody unnecessarily. There were very few people that were actually considered righteous as far as God was concerned. But you'll find out that almost every single one of them was not a righteous king. How about the priests? Well, do you remember, um, uh, I believe it was Samuel's sons, or no, it was um, Aaron's sons, uh, Phineas, and anyway, they were the ones that offered the, the profane fire on the altar. Why? Why was it profane fire? Well, because it was, they had allowed, their job was to keep this fire going so that there would constantly be, be coals for the incense to be put on. And for whatever reason, whether they fell asleep or got distracted or whatever, they allowed those coals to go off. And so they had this idea, okay, we'll just go take it out of the, the campfire. We'll use these coals. Nobody will know the difference. God knows the difference. He does. If we're not doing something according to what he instructs us to do, where is that any different than us offering profane fire? When we want God to accept our righteousness, no matter what it is. So, many, so often, we see people that want power. They want authority. They want money. They want whatever else. Look at the past few decades. How many pastors have gone down that road and been the subject of major controversy? Whether it be lust, whether it be money, whether it be, you know, power, whatever they were um, lured by. And finding a righteous leader or a righteous pastor is not necessarily easy. If God is our Father, what kind of children must we genuinely be? If you are a child of the King, do you act like a prince or a princess? If you are a child of a priest, do you dishonor him or his office by your actions, your attitudes, your words? When you are anointed into office, Yahweh expects you to live your life to a higher standard. Yeshua did, and the term Christian means like Christ. Are you truly like Christ? Or are you a Christian in name or affiliation only? Examine your life and your motives. If you're truly wanting to take your life to a greater level, and this is talking about living a life of greatness, seek to be anointed. Now in closing this study, I want to say, don't try to put Yahweh in a box. He set down guidelines for us to follow. That's what, we're, that's what we profess, is these guidelines. He set down guidelines for us to follow, but he is the master and can do as he sees fit. If he chooses to give someone the Holy Spirit before baptism, it's his choice. If he chooses to deny someone the Holy Spirit, it's his choice. If he chooses to give salvation to someone who isn't baptized, it's his choice. We can't just arbitrarily decide not to follow Yahweh's guidelines and expect him to be okay with it. I mentioned that just a, a little while ago. We cannot expect him to accept our righteousness. So as a closing thought, set your goals to accept Yeshua and his sacrifice. This is where repentance and baptism come in. Once you're anointed, become the prince or princess you were called to be. And overall, be like Christ. Thank you, brother. Father, we come before you so very thankful to you for this message. 
And we give you the honor and glory for it, Father. I thank you so very much. We ask, Father, that you will work in our lives. Help us to be the children that you've called us to be, that you want us to be, that you've designed us to be, that you created us to be. We have so much potential, and yet we've wasted away in this life, in this world, doing our own thing, our own, our own desires, our own ways. It's such a horrible life that we lead. And we wonder why there's so much sin in the world. We wonder why we have so many problems in our life. And yet time after time after time, you promise to bless us as long as, as we seek you first and put your kingdom first in our minds, in our hearts, in our, in our thoughts, in our actions. We thank you so very much for everything that you've provided for us. We know, Father, that so many times we don't even recognize the blessings in our life, whether it be your salvation where you save us from maybe a car wreck or some devastating accident. And sometimes even when we have that car wreck or that accident, Father, you step into our lives and we find out that where we should have been dead, we're not. Where something major should have happened and the doctors are are totally totally confused about it and yet show us father that you were the ones one in that moment that gave us salvation yes not salvation as for our sins being removed but salvation in that moment of time and that is such a big blessing, and so many of us don't even recognize that. So again, we thank you. We come to the end of this service today. You are awesome, Father. We, again, help us to understand in a deep way how you work in our lives. And even more so, Father, help us to have that relationship with you as our Father. Help us to have that relationship with Yeshua, our brother. Help us to learn and to grow from your word and to make a change not only in our life, but ultimately in the entire world. Thank you for everything, and we ask it all in your son Yeshua's precious name. Hallelujah.